uh, modern, mapping the modern media landscape. Um, most importantly, why it's important, why we'd want to do it, and how. Uh, because those are really the areas where I get questions. So um, the company uh, that I started is called Ad Fontes Media. So Ad Fontes is Latin for to the source. And as we um, go along, it'll become more apparent why I chose that name uh, for this company. But um, where, I'll talk, and I'll talk about where it is right now. So the media bias chart, a lot of you have seen it on the internet. You, maybe you have seen other um, versions of it, previous versions over the last two years. This is about its fourth iteration. And it's really two things. One, it's a new taxonomy for discussing the media landscape. It's a system of classification. And it's a methodology for rating quality and bias on that taxonomy. So I first had to create the world in which you talk about it, and then uh, create the methodology for placing things in a fixed um, time and space on that chart. It's um, hard to do just because there are so many moving parts to it. We'll get into that. But tonight what I wanted to cover are a few things. First, um, why, uh, why a chart? Um, why it resonates and you know, why so many people have just shared it online, I think it would be something of interest to you. And why it's actually helpful and what we can do with it. Um, those are other questions I get all the time, so I thought we'd cover that. I uh, wanted to do an overview of the taxonomy. So we'll go through and define what the axes and the categories are, and then talk about the methodology. How do we actually determine what sources to put where on the chart? And this is really where I'll get in. I can get into the details as granular as you want. I love talking about this stuff. Um, it's like, a, like I call people who follow my blog news nerds because we just love the news and we love analyzing it. And you're at the Denver Press Club on a Thursday evening, so you all are probably news nerds too. So the methodology is content analysis driven. Um, it, rather than consumer perception driven. So consumer perception driven meaning polls, asking people who are reading the sources what they think about the sources. This is, there's a lot of that out there, and this is not that. This is looking at the actual source itself and what it can tell us. And we do that on a story by story and element by element basis. So by stories I mean articles or shows, stories on shows, and then the elements meaning like the individual parts of it. Uh, we have some uh, article and show grading rubrics that I will share with you. And then um, there's a, a couple of subcharts that I have for the different cable news channels, such as uh, CNN, MSNBC, and, uh, and Fox. So I'll show you those at the end uh, to show how we uh, differentiate between those as well. Uh, but, oh, I missed the most important part, which is questions. I would love for you to ask questions. Um, give me like five minutes to like really get into the, uh, the first things. But then as we go along, go ahead and raise your hand, shout them out. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and we'll leave some time at the end. I'll stick around for questions as well. All right. So how did I end up here talking to you about the media bias chart? Um, I mean, I'm a patent attorney. I'm not a journalist. Uh, Journalism is not my profession. Um, so two years ago, I would have also been very surprised to know that I'd be speaking to anyone and anyone would care to hear what I had to say about the media landscape. And what I do as a patent attorney is I explain co complex concepts through words and pictures. But what I found is that the pictures are really the thing that um, relay the most understanding when something's complex. So I just remember in the lead up to the um, 2016 election being alarmed personally by the kinds of um, content, uh, some of it you can't really call news, but the kind of content people would share on Facebook and Twitter and use that to support their arguments and opinions. And I, I would be alarmed because people would use things to support their arguments that I would just immediately discredit. I'd say, you know, that's a terrible source. Why are you using that source? But people can't tell necessarily. Unless you're in this world of reading a lot of different news sources, you can't necessarily differentiate because you're just looking at one piece and there's a huge uh, landscape to, uh, to compare it to. 
So I thought, you know, you could really map this out. I mean, there are some sources that are better and some sources that are worse, and then some that are more uh, biased this way and some that are more biased this way. So I had this in my head and I put it down on paper. Um, you know, I'm not a graphic designer or anything. I just use like use my program that I called Visio that I use for like doing patent drawings. Uh, and I put it on Facebook because I really wanted to explain it to some of my friends. And then at first, like eight people shared it because I had it on like the private sharing, like the regular setting. I didn't even know there was like a public Facebook sharing setting. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, eight? That's a lot that a lot of people shared it. <laughs> I mean, have you guys ever had, had anybody share something that you wrote on Facebook eight times? Like, the first time it happens, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> but then, like a couple months later, somebody who knows how to use Facebook <laughs> shared it publicly, and they're like, hi, I don't know you, but um, this thing like had 20,000 shares. Um, and then it just kind of went all over the internet. But then people started asking me, um, oh, great, can teachers and pro college professors uh, teach you know, media literacy and, and journalism? Uh, would, it, they'd ask me, oh, great, can I use this in my class? Uh, can I print it in my textbook? Uh, what's your, uh, what data did you use? What is your methodology? And that really surprised me, that part, because I, uh, I was shocked that they would want to, do, uh, want to use that. And I, I thought, is there really nothing else out there like this? And I looked around and there wasn't. And I started to think about why. And I also started to think about the fact that because people are relying on this, um, this is a thing that's influencing people. Anything that gets a lot of traction on the internet influences people. And I know that. And uh, therefore, I have a responsibility to make it as good as I can. I have a responsibility to make sure that it's as accurate as possible within certain definitions. Uh, and it um, has as much data as possible. And so I kept working on uh, refining it and developing it and uh, taking in input from, uh, from journalists and observers and academics and um, coming up with uh, more and more refined methodology. But then after a certain point, there's only so much that I can do by myself because there's a lot of sources out there, and there are a lot of articles for each of these sources. Uh, so I you know, started um, seeing if there would be interest in people helping me with this, and there was. Um, I just recently ended a crowdfunding campaign to take this media bias chart to the next level, which would be like an interactive, dynamic version uh, that would rate sources ongoingly and then provide that data uh, to organizations that would be interested in having that data. So consumers could um, you rely on the chart in the future for free, but then we'd also have the data behind it um, that others could use. Uh, not only to you know, trust what we're putting out there, but also to um, use it for other purposes, which I'll get into in a little bit. And so we raised over $30,000 with that crowdfunding campaign, uh, and I'm really excited about that. Um, so that's where I am uh, today. So why a chart? So it's two, two visual dimensions. Um, there's almost infinite things to measure about uh, news content, but two dim uh, dimensions people can handle. Uh, quality and political bias are distinct measures. They overlap in a lot of ways, but um, there are things that are unique to each dimension. And current models for discussing these measures are typically one-dimensional. So what do I mean by that? One is uh, fact-checking. Fact-checking is really important. It's what defines the difference between um, new, like, actual news and fake news, right? But that's not the only problem with the media landscape. My chart actually does not deal very much with fake news at all. Like there are a few on the bottom there that you could classify as fake news, but there's, you know, here's the chart. There's this whole world of like fake news underneath it that's not even on the chart. There are other kinds of quality problems with, uh, with news sources besides uh, things that are fact checkable because not everything is fact checkable. If somebody has a statement in uh, an article that you read or a show that you watch that says, government corruption is absolute, that's not a fact checkable statement. That's an opinion. And so much of the content that we consume is analysis and opinion. So another one, uh, another one dimensional way to look at um, news quality and bias is just looking at bias. And there are bias rating sites and polls. And when it, particularly, when, particularly when it comes to polls, 
It's really just about asking the consumer what, what they think. So if you ask somebody, if you're trying to find out about trustworthiness of a news source, and you ask somebody who's very conservative, is Fox News trustworthy? They will probably tell you yes. But if you ask somebody who is uh, liberal, and uh, it is Fox News trustworthy, they will tell you no. And that doesn't actually tell you anything about the, uh, the trustworthiness of the source itself. It just tells you about the political persuasion of the person that you're asking. Ah. So the other reason is that modes of criticism and defense of media bias and quality are uh, ad hoc. And the best examples I can give are on Twitter. So Twitter is just, ad hoc ideas all the time, everywhere. Um, you're all a journalist, uh, are interested in journalism, so I imagine your Twitter feed looks a lot like mine, and it follows a lot of news, so there's just tons of hot takes and tons of opinions. And so if people want to talk about how um, good or bad the news is, they'll say, look at this article from the New York Times and how terrible it was for this reason. Or they'll say, look at this piece of journalism from the New Yorker and how good it was and for this reason. But those, only, those are only uh, examples and pieces that it doesn't give you a picture of the whole landscape. So that's why the chart, you know, showing a landscape is helpful. Uh, another reason it's helpful is because of something I like to say, which is all generalizations are false. Now, that was originally the title of my blog when I first started you know, blogging about media and politics, and I had like four people who would read it, including <laughs> sometimes my mom, right? That's how, <laughs> that's how blogs work. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, who wants to read like 6,000 words that I write? Um, and so, all generalizations are false is itself a generalization, which means that um, it's false, and that some generalizations are actually true. So generalizations themselves are just linguistic constructs, and they're a, they're a way that we talk about the media in particular really often. So one way to talk about, so if you're going from like very general to very specific, that's what this line means. Um, so one way people talk about the news is they say, ah, CNN is the worst. So you can have this conversation at Thanksgiving dinner and you can replace you know, CNN with any other news source or whatever. Um, so that's one way to talk about the news. And it's more general, but it's less true because you can come up with counter examples. For example, other sources that are worse than CNN or a time that CNN did a good thing. But it's easy to communicate and that's why we talk like that. The other way to talk is very specific. So you can say, on June 8, 2012, CNN did this very specific thing and it was a very specific mistake and that was bad. And people can really agree on that when you get that granular, right? They did make this mistake at this time. So that's more specific, it's more true, but it's hard to communicate. It's like that ad hoc way of, um, of talking about the media. So the chart is helpful because you can kind of strike a balance and you can say, well, CNN is generally here. All right, I'll blow this up on the next slide. Um, but it's, got, it's a balance between general and specific. It contains some of the nuance, but certainly not all of it. And it's still easy to communicate. You can still have a conversation and really focus in on exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about the quality or bias of, in this example, CNN. You know, here, here's CNN right in the middle. I have a blog post entitled, Everybody Has an Opinion on CNN. Um, because I, um, I am told that it should be much higher and much lower and much farther right and much farther left, so, okay? So the reason, uh, but we can talk about that.